What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Links and Locks Best Bets podcast presented by Bet365. I'm Jason Sobel from the Action Network. He's Ben Everill from Golf Bet. And we made it. We're here. The final of four major championships, the 151st Open Championship being held at Royal Liverpool this week. We'll dive right in momentarily with 18 bets playing 18 holes over the next little bit. But before we go any further, a reminder that the Links and Locks podcast is proudly presented by Bet365, the world's favorite sportsbook brand. Sign up with promo code ACTION to get Bet365's exclusive sign-up offer. Bet $1 in any game. Get $200 in bonus bets. Must be 21 or older. Offer available in Colorado, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, and Iowa in the U.S. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Benny, good to be back with you and good to be talking at least about the final major championship of the year. Although I will say that you and I both have a little FOMO not being there this week. Oh, hundred percent. Um, you know, obviously he was there last year and was even drinking out of the jug at the end of it. Uh, what a fantastic effort there by Cameron Smith. And yeah, it's a bit, bit difficult not being there this year, but you know what? There's also some fun in the old all night as you get when you're over here in the States going from wire to wire, watching these guys through the night and, and, and getting your golf finished, you know, before the afternoon on the weekend. So you can, can go out and play your own golf or have a swim if you're in California or do whatever you need to do. So uh, we're not getting the wind and the rain that those guys are getting. Uh, yeah, so there's there's some benefits for it. There's nothing better, by the way. Spoke with uh, John Wood from NBC last week on my radio show, and he said, yeah, I'm heading over there. It's uh, unfortunately going to be rainy and windy, it looks like, throughout the week. I said, you know, that's unfortunate for you because you're going there. I said, for those of us, who aren't traveling, there's nothing better than laying on the couch at eight o'clock in the morning with a big old egg sandwich sitting on your chest going, how come those guys are wearing rain pants? What's up with that wool hat? Come on, guys, suck it up. It ain't that bad while you're sitting in 90 degree weather here in the U.S. and they are, uh, you know, dealing with all the uh, the the wet and the uh, the blowing and, and everything else they're getting out there. But uh, you and I have both been there. It's a great time. It's a great week. But yeah, the, it looks like the weather might be coming through there a little bit this week. Yeah, the, the big FOMO is usually the uh, the free golf the media tend to get when we're over there. <laughs> so <laughs> playing a lot of golf, that's the that's what we're getting messages from mates that are over there rubbing it in a little bit. Look, um, yeah, it's it's going to be a great week nonetheless. I'm really looking forward to it. We just had a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a tidbit of an appetizer with the Scottish Open there and Rory back into form just to throw things up there for everybody. Um, your man, Bobby, Bobby, Robert McIntyre. I thought you had him. I thought he was there. What a sensational final round. You had him at long odds last week, mate. I was riding him home for you. Uh, but look, for the first time in a long time, Rory actually went and took an event. And that's good signs for the Rory fans out there. I was asked the question today, does it matter how Rory won? And my answer is 100% Why? absolutely. If Rory had a four-shot lead going into the final round and bogeyed the last two holes and wound up winning by one because nobody else came and got it, we would still be sitting here criticizing Rory for not really closing out a golf tournament, even though he beat everybody else. But to come back and be one down on the 17th tee box, hit an absolute dart on 17, a par three, make birdie there, and then hit what he called one of the best shots of his career on 18, a two iron from over 200 yards to 10 feet, and make the putt. That is some... Fantastic stuff. I'd be even more appreciative of it if, as you mentioned, I wasn't sitting there with a big old Robert <laughs> McIntyre ticket. Come on, Rory. You're killing me, man. Uh, uh, it's good stuff. And look, and and regular listeners and people who do read the, the odd thing I write every now and then would know that I've been fading Rory for a long time. And including I faded him after before the tournament last week, faded his number uh, after the first round. And had I been on deck rounds two and three, I would have faded him again at the numbers he was. Uh, because I hadn't seen what I needed to see. But what you just said is 100%. It's not so much that he won. It's that he needed a little bit of luck, sure. But when the moment presented itself, when he had to finish strong, he was able to do it. And that has been what he's not been able to do in recent times. So I feel like that's a corner uh, turned. Um, good for him. And look, he's gone to the Open where he won it last time. And, yep. you know, I was saying this to you earlier. I, I For some reason, I was thinking, oh, you know, the... The Open, we get some random winners. We've got the Todd Hamiltons, Ben Curtis. But the reality is, 
we've had pretty chalky winners since maybe Darren Clark, since we've been really, truly surprised. I mean, momentum and chalk does win these things. So that is a big factor in what you'll hear from my nine holes coming up. Ben, I'm with you. I, I give you some grief on this podcast because uh, you tend to go more chalky than I do with your selections, but I'm I'm fairly chalky this week. There aren't too many uh, big long shots on the list because quite frankly, and, and it surprises me as well, because like you said, you do the research thinking that uh, there's got to be a lot of surprises, a lot of long shots, a lot of guys with big numbers. And yet, even with sort of the vagary of the link style play, you'd think, Oh, well, you know, some guy just happens to avoid all the bunkers one week and, you know, out of nowhere, a 400 to one long shot finishes in third place. It really doesn't happen. I, I want to read something off to you here. This is from my preview at uh, actionnetwork.com and the action app this week where you can find it. 6,331 words, by the way, uh, only <laughs> took me like 12 minutes uh, going back four years, top five of the open 2018 Molinari. Kisner, McElroy, Rose, Shoffley. Uh, Molinari was playing like one of the best players in the world at the time. Kisner was certainly playing much better than he is right now. The other three don't need any explanation. 2019 at Portrush, Shane Lowry, Fleetwood, Finau, Kepka, Westwood. May maybe you didn't pick Lowry to win that week, but certainly no names on that list that would surprise you. 2021, Morikawa wins. Spieth, Ustazen, Rom, Dylan Fratelli. Maybe you go, okay, of the 15 names I've heard so far, Dylan Fratelli, eh, that's kind of off the radar a little bit, but he was a top 100 player for much of that year. And then last year, I, Cam Smith, Cameron Young, Rory McIlroy, Tommy Fleetwood, Victor Hovland, studs. Every single one of them, a stud. And so you go back over the last four editions covering five years of the Open Championship, that's 20 names who have finished in the top five, and maybe one of them, who finished solo fifth two years ago, Dylan Fratelli, might be the only non-chalky name on the top of one of those leaderboards. Was that the year that he won the John Deere Classic as well? I mean, it's possible that he won the JDC coming into it. We'll have to have a look at that. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure he won it in 2019 and flew over, and that's why he contended. We talk about momentum and chalk. So even that might be the case. Uh, look, at actually, he was... Uh... Fresh off a whole bunch of missed cuts and randomly finished in fifth place at the open that year. So uh, look again, if you want to call him the one outlier and say, yeah. Hey, you know, it can happen fine. But all of that said, for the most part, it has been chalky at the top of these leaderboards. And we've seen that uh, over the last four editions of this event, Benny. All right, mate. Yeah. I love it. And instead of said, this is going to be part of my, part of my hole. So if you want me to crack on, we'll go into that first hole. I've already been talking about this man. The first hole, I'll give you my first outright choice, and it is Rory McIlroy, who is the favourite. I do not love the number, of course. What is it, seven to one in most places? But here's the thing. If not now, when? When it comes to him breaking this major drought, uh, Rory, look, he won it at Royal Liverpool in 2014, and he dominated then, to be fair. Um, look, one side of the draw did get sort of stitched up that year with the weather, but still, he was ahead by, I want to say, one in the first round, four through 36 and maybe even six shots through 54 holes before winning by a couple. And look, the, I think it was Ricky Fowler came at him and got to the lead or maybe close to the lead, but Rory was able to rebound and and take him down on that Sunday. So he's got that going for him. He's got the momentum that we talked about, not just the fact that he won. He's got six top tens of his last six starts uh, on tour. And it was the way he won that was important to me. His tee to green game is stellar right now. His putter turned up in Scotland, although it did turn up more than you can hope for in the final round at Scotland. Like you can't expect him to be making 125 feet of putts like he did um, there, but you hope that maybe it's you know 100 or, or 85 or whatnot on most days. If he brings that and brings the confidence that he's got, then, then Rory is someone that you can't ignore at least. You can ignore the number. So my advice might be uh, wait for the first round. You know, you know, you could maybe even dip in like, you know, my usual strategy. Maybe you want to put him in first round leader to get a bit better odds and then wait and see what happens. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm now a believer after not being a believer at all for years on Rory, for months on Rory. Yeah, look, I, I think uh, you make a lot of sense with what you said there. And I, I am also a firm believer. I, I get it. If you just watch Rory for the last four days at the Scottish Open and say, man, I really like him. I think he's going to win the Open. I got no problem with that. If you're chasing them three tournament at plus 650, plus 700, 
it's a really, really short number. It doesn't, what it does is it, it limits where you can go elsewhere on your card because you can't go, okay, I want Rory at plus 650, but then I'm going to take eight other guys. It, it's just, you're, yeah. you're limiting the potential. You can't do that. And so I like exactly what you said there, which is uh, wait on Rory. Look, he has a propensity to get off to some slow starts. If he shoots, let's say, a one over 72 in the opening round, he's five shots back. He's maybe plus, what, 1150, plus 1200. Yeah. And all of a sudden you jump on him there at a number that's almost twice of what he started at. I, I think that's a much smarter play there. And that's what I will uh, look to be doing a little bit. All right. I am going to start with my long shot play, as I do every week here on the podcast for hole number two. I've actually got two long shots. And as we've seen in the first three majors of the year and uh, following suit in the fourth one, live players are essentially a little bit underpriced, undervalued in the marketplace. Now, I think it's, they've caught up to the numbers on the top players, the Cam Smiths, the Brooks Kepkas, they're essentially priced where they should be priced. The guys further down the board, though, are getting no respect. And I found two guys who are former champions at the Open. Guys who have multiple other top three finishes and guys who are getting absolutely no respect whatsoever. I'm going to go with Louis Oosthuizen at 110 to 1 and Henrik Stenson at 400 to 1. Massive numbers on a couple of guys that look, if you're asking me, do I think either one of them is going to win at Royal Liverpool this week? My answer is no. But I think the probability is better that, you know, it, what, if you play this event this week, a hundred different times there's going to be at least a few times few of those times where each of these guys has a chance of winning and so that's ex essentially what i'm doing is I i'm looking for one of those long shot plays i think it's a chalky week as we talked about in the intro i, I think we're going to see some of the big names at the top of the leaderboard uh, i've got one for you later on when i give my favorite outright play uh, on the last hole of this podcast but if you're looking for a long shot rather than a young player who hasn't been there and done that. I'm sticking with guys who have been there. I'm sticking with guys who have proven that they can do it. I, Louis Uste is, and for some reason gets treated like he's a 60 year old. He's 40 <laughs> years old. He, he's 40. He's younger than Adam Scott, Justin Rose. I mean, he's six years older than Ricky Fowler. I, yeah. Like it's six years older than, or seven years older than Rory McIlroy. I mean, Louis is not that old. Henrik Sten's a little bit older at 50, uh, excuse me, 47. But each of those guys that, with a big number next to their name, why not? I, take a chance on them. If you're taking a chance on anybody, might as well take a chance on somebody that has been there and done that. Yeah, look, uh, in in the UK, they've been betting for donkey's years, right? It's been a very obvious thing. But they've also been doing each way bets. So, like, as I said, we, we want to go chalk like that. That's a good chance for the each way, I see it as. Yeah. You know, you put your little... Yeah, your couple of bucks on the outright, but also throwing a couple on the the place, whether it be top five, top six, depending on where you are, and then you're going to get some potential value because you're right. They could they could easily be the guy. And look, we we didn't think that um, Tom Watson was going to contend when he was a million years old either. Either and uh, Greg Norman did a year prior to that as well without winning. Um, there's a couple of candidates. One guy obviously is Paddy Harrington, but his number is way too short <laughs> to think about. Sort of in the same sort of. Uh, scenario got some patty harrington for you later in the pod don't worry about oh, it. there you go um all right let's go i i, I i'll i'll preface that i'm going to do my long shot a little later but my long shots are nowhere near yours because of that chalk i'm looking at that 50 plus as the quote unquote long shots this week because um i just don't see anyone in that triple digits that yeah sure someone might contend but i just don't see them winning i could be wrong uh i'm going to go to the third hole with a top five play now my Top five, 10, and 20 plays this week are all guys I think who can win this, just FYI. So if you want to go across the board uh, and give them a bit of love in the outright market, do so. Uh, first one is just five to one for a top five, so there's clearly some chalk. Contended both times he's played in, in the Open Championship. He's been 12th, he's been 4th. He was in the final group a year ago. He's a better player now. He's a smarter player now. He won the Memorial this year. He was a runner-up at the PGA this year. He's been in the top 30 everywhere he's played since. Uh, Victor Hovland, I think, is a very clever play across the board here. Uh, I've got him there slated as essentially my third guy. So in the top five at plus 500 for Victor Hovland. And he's Aussie Caddyshay. 
I, I believe that Victor Hovland will also be in the top five, but I won't tell you until later in the podcast. I had a feeling, oh. I, I thought this might be one of the weeks where we had the same guy at the end of the pod as our favorite outright play. I, I can confirm though that we have different players because, well, you just talked about Hovland, and like I said, I'll talk about him later. So he would have yes, been I'm, my, I'm he would have been on my board. first hole. However, Rory has come over the top of him for me there. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. All right, uh, go to the fourth hole. I will go to my top five play, and I bet that there's a big three in the world of golf. Uh, there's Rory McIlroy, who everyone's talking about coming off that Scottish Open win. He's either the favorite or co-favorite, depending on the book you're looking at right now. There's Scotty Scheffler, and everyone's talking about. Scotty's dominance, especially T to green. The fact that he's finished top five, what, six straight weeks, seven straight weeks. I mean, he's he's been unbelievable just without putting together the wins. But everyone's talking about him. The question around the third member of the big three is, uh, where, where's John? Where's yes. John Rob been? So I interviewed him after the final round of the U.S. Open last month where he shot 65. He looked like, just like any of us who need to get away from work for a while, He looked like he just wanted to like go somewhere and lay on a beach for a week. And he told me as much. He said, I can't wait travelers next week. And then I'm shutting it down. I haven't had a break like this in a long time. I can't wait. Probably not a surprise. that He missed the cut at the travelers the very next week. Got to start that vacation a little bit early. All of that said, from what I've heard, John Rahm is, is put a little bit more of an onus on the open championship this year. He's gone down the rabbit hole. He'll sit around at night and watch YouTube videos of whether it's the 2014 open championship at Royal Liverpool, or just watching old open championships of great links players. Uh, He is very, very determined to go out and play well at this one. After winning the masters earlier this year, I give him credit. He was asked, you know, is this the major you'd always dreamed about? He said, look, I I love Seve and I love following in Seve's footsteps and anything Seve has done. I want to do. So I wanted to win the masters, but really Growing up, the Open Championship was yeah. the biggest one for me. I, I think everyone's kind of forgetting about John Rahm. I think in comparison to Rory and Scotty, his number is too big. Top five, plus 260. I've seen it at plus 300 in some books. I, I think it's a great play on John Rahm this week. Yeah, look, not on my cards here today, uh, the two guys you just like, Rahm and Scheffler, but I, for no good reason. You know what I mean? Like, it's, other than the number. Um, but the number for Ram, as you mentioned, is actually creeping up, which is nice. It's good to see. Um, he does want to win it badly. I have heard the same reports about him getting down the rabbit holes, et cetera. Um, and, and he's also a, his, a his history guy, right? Like, you know, he wants to win them all. You know, he wants to start knocking them off. Yeah. Um, and so would I be surprised if he's there leading up to the first round there in the clutch? Of course not. Um, John Ram is someone you've got to have a got to have your eye on despite the fact that he hasn't been like dominant dominant chances at the open so far he clearly has the game for it yep um yep. all right so where are we the fifth hole i'll go to the fifth hole and i'll give you a top 10 play another chalky one for you another guy who look as i said you can go across the board but i put him in the top 10 because i think he quote unquote needs a bit of luck to win and that's proven because he hasn't been winning with chances across the board of late or of the last few years. Uh, and that is Tommy Fleetwood, plus 250 for a top 10. I love how he is playing, how he's getting himself in contention. He hovered there at the Scottish without getting it done. Um, without getting it done at the, at the death, he was just par after par after par after par. And I'm sitting there thinking, maybe this is the week where he gets the luck because he's hanging in there doing nothing, but he was hanging there with a chance. He wasn't able to take it up a notch um, over the closing few holes. But it strikes me as a guy who... Because, you know, he's been second and fourth in the Opens before. He knows how to be there. And, and it's obviously in England, his home country. So he'll also be pumped for that. He's a guy that when he wins one, if he does, it's going to be a little bit of luck here. And it's going to be a bounce of the ball or it's going to be something. Or, you know, the ball ball's going to skirt out across a bunker and things are going to work out for him. I think that to win, he needs that luck. But to contend, he doesn't. He's got the game. So that's why I've got him in the top 10 slot plus 250. A lot of what you just said right there can apply to my top 10 play. Uh, here as well I, in fact i thought you were going to go with the guy that i'm going with and there there are a ton of parallels here but uh for the sixth hole i will go with the top 10 on tyrell hatton who uh, again i very very similar to fleetwood um steady solid plays great on links golf courses doesn't quite win 
as much as we think he probably should win. That said, can he win this week? Of course. I really like him to at least have a, a another strong finish as he did last week. He is still ranked third in strokes gain total on the PGA Tour this season. Not sure how many times I've brought it up on the pod. Uh, it seems like every week, but that is the greatest barometer of performance. He is playing like the third best player on the PGA Tour. Probably, like you said about Fleetwood, needs a little luck to break through and get to that winner's circle. But he's not that far off, and it wouldn't shock me whatsoever. I've got some Hatton outright plays this week. Um, so it's, it's not a stretch to think that he can, uh, win this golf tournament, but top 10 is, uh, is a nice play right in his wheelhouse. All right. Seventh hole, Benny. Yeah. Seventh. I'll look, I'll, I'll give you my Hatton play because I've got Hatton as a top 20 play for the same reason you just said he's my top 20 guy, but I also like Xander Shoffley and I noticed they're both about the plus one ten mark thought maybe you might want to throw them in together in a parlay. If you want to get a little bit more juice, if you can, or individually, as I said, at the plus one ten ish scenario look they've showed enough to suggest they have some form on the board they are plus money options for the top 20 they can theoretically win this thing uh do if they get some luck uh, especially uh get themselves in contention down the strip stretch i was i tell you i was a little annoyed with hatton um watching him on sunday just because i thought that was his to take he got himself in position he goes to the 10th hole which is the par five and i know he was claiming that the ball sort of moved as he was about to hit it from the fairway or something or other got his attention. But to, to bogey that hole was really poor. And then to not only, but then got himself back in it by birding the next two and then made a terrible three putt um, to bogey again and then go out off the rails and out of contention. Those are the things that stop him from winning, but they don't stop him from contending, as you said. So top 20, I think him and Shuffle together at the, the, uh, I always scan as we get to top 20s and top 40s. I scanned the plus numbers before I start. They were near there at the top of that. But I think, as I said, it's a chalky week. Those two potentially as a parlay is something to look for. Yeah, zero problem with either of those, obviously. Uh, I have got my top 20 picks, and I've got two names for you as well, a little bit further down the board, uh, a little less chalky here. But uh, look, I, I mentioned on last week's podcast before the Scottish Open that essentially it was a two-week preview. And essentially, if you liked the guy last week, don't jump off of him when you get to this week. Well, I liked Adam Scott last week, <laughs> and he missed the cut. He missed the cut, but he shot 72 in the opening round, came back with a 67 the next day. This yeah. was not bad golf. I mean, maybe a couple of bad breaks here and there. Maybe he should have played better, but it's not as if he shot a couple of 79s last week. So I've got Adam Scott here for a top 20. Another guy that I had on last week's pod for a top 20 who finished in 12th place and wound up cashing those tickets is Ryan Fox. And I look at Ryan Fox as you and I have mentioned him a lot on the podcast this year, a lot of top twenties, top thirties, essentially get him on familiar territory, meaning uh, link style courses. And that ups his baseline. I think a top 20 play on Fox is uh, very sensible this week as well. You've got Scott at plus 260, Fox at plus 320. I like each of them. Maybe, maybe a parlay, your guys, Hatton and Shoffley, my guys, Scott and Fox, and you get yeah. a little four man parlay with the four of them. Yeah, that would be that not so bad. You mentioned not giving up. Um, I'm I'm the same. I'm giving Adam Scott another shot here, so I'm going to move him around. I had him later in the in the cardi, but I'll move it up to hole nine. Um, so you mentioned Scotty rebounding. He also, how do I put this? He, he, the last hole he played that may or may not have helped him make the cut. Maybe it didn't look like he gave his full attention to that last part and he ended up right. lose, missing it by one shot. I wonder if he wanted to get over when he realized he hadn't had a great first round. Did he want to get over to Royal Liverpool quicker? Maybe I'm speculating. I haven't talked to him, et cetera, but I'm not prepared to give up on him. But I will say that if I'm, if you're, if you're worried about him being a winner or you're worried about him being right at the top, I saw him in a matchup uh, plus three fifty that you can get him. Well, he only has to beat Cam Young. I know he was runner-up last year, but he's not playing anywhere near like he did um, this year. Uh, Tom Kim, who played well last week, but not guaranteed that he's going to play well this week. Um, JT, who's not been playing well for most of the year. Uh, and Fitzpatrick, who could be the bolter in that. But, you know, to beat four guys, plus 350, and a guy who I think can actually, as I said, he can be a bolter. He can be someone that... Um, if you want to talk long shots, I, I originally had him in there at about the 75 to one, but I thought everyone will get on me for getting on another Aussie. So I'll make it a little easier on you um, either. And the other thing too is you could just get him at top Australian. I don't know what the odds are. They wouldn't be great because he's probably the most favored of the Aussies, uh, but that's another option as well. 
Well, Cam Smith is going to be number one on that list, but right, of course, yeah, Adam Scott up there as well. I, he makes sense in that group. Cam Young, I know he finished in the top ten at the John Deere Classic a couple of weeks ago, but before that, outside the top thirty, and I believe seven straight events. Justin Thomas, who knows where he is right now? The odds are drifting <laughs> hard on JT. I mean, uh, by the time this pod is posted, people are listening. He might be triple digits. I mean, he he went from like. 50 or 60 to 75 to 80 to one uh, just this afternoon on Monday alone. And then what was the other name you just mentioned there? Fitzpatrick. Uh, Fitzpatrick had a quote on Monday in his press conference saying, yeah, I wouldn't play me this week. Look, I'm not in great form. Uh, the open suits me uh, worse than the other three major championships. Don't love links golf. Don't love this one. Maybe a top 30 this week. That's about it. Himself. <laughs> can you imagine? I I can only imagine the the betters out there who look at that quote and go, "Ah, you know what? I'm still be- playing them for a top five this week." Like <laughs> you don't know your game. I know your game better than you know your game. That <laughs> that takes some guts to go out there when a guy says, "Yeah, maybe top thirty this week," and you go, "No, no, no, no. better than that. I'm going to bet on it." Yeah, as I said, so I like I like the plus number there for Adam Scott over those four guys. Yeah. I think that. If you're looking for a Scotty bet that's a bit more conservative than the ones that I would advocate normally, there's one for you. Yeah, I like that. All right. As we make the turn, one more reminder that the Links and Locks podcast is proudly presented by Bet365, the world's favorite sports book brand. Sign up with promo code ACTION, A-C-T-I-O-N, to get Bet365's exclusive sign-up offer. Bet $1 on any game. Get $200 in bonus bets. Must be 21 or older. Offer available in Colorado, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, and Iowa in the U.S. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. We make the turn. We get to the 10th hole. I am on the tee, and as usual, I will go with my first-round leader play. And, Benny, it's the same one as last week. We (laughs) talked about last week. You're going to have some of the same plays. It makes sense. Similar styles of golf courses, similar fields. Uh, Jordan Spieth, oh, by the way, did not cash first-round leader tickets last week but what i found is that in his last five open championship starts he's broken par in 17 of 20 rounds broken 70 in 15 of 20 rounds on thursdays he has a scoring average of 68.6 in those rounds Uh, look we're looking for a guy that can go low on Lynx golf course i mean i jordan spieth makes so much sense on, on a thursday uh especially if it's uh uh, you know, playing a little bit easier. Maybe you can roll in some longer putts, whatever the case. Uh, again, I know it didn't work out last week. And look, we're throwing darts for a first round leader play, but I want a high variance, high volatility player. That's Jordan Spieth to a T. Well, mate, I've just had to move my first round leader up. And that's where I, he was my, one of my, my winner for last week. Obviously he didn't do that. He didn't play that great at all. Uh, but I've slotted him by the same token you've talked about, not giving up on him completely. I put him down there in the first round leader spot as well, for exactly the same reasons that you have. Now, look, I'll throw you one more. I'm throwing this name out there because I like him this week and I haven't found him, haven't got another spot for him. So here's another another guy to look at, and that is Ricky Fowler, at 35 yeah. to one for first round leader. As we said, he was runner up in 2014 at this venue. He's got four top 15s in the Open. He's a recent winner on the PGA Tour. He had three pretty good rounds at the Scottish Open before a final round fade out, which I think was as much to do with, uh, you know, thinking ahead and playing in tough wins where you're thinking ahead is going to see your score balloon a little. He's ninth on the PGA Tour for first round scoring average this year. So Ricky Fowler and or Jordan Spieth, uh, chalky-ish names at mm-hmm. somewhat value for first round leader. Yeah, Ricky, co-first round leader, remember, at the U.S. Open last month. I had him there and with the chop it when he shot a 62 and Xander tied him a few minutes later. Uh, talk about yeah. feeling like a bad beat. You win and you still don't feel like you win when uh, your guy shoots 62 and doesn't even take the full haul for a first round leader play. 12th hole. You mentioned his name earlier, Ben. Podrick Harrington. I've got a good feeling about Podrick this week. He's 51 years old. You know what? Once upon a time, a guy who was 59 years old would have, could have, should have won this golf tournament back in 09 when Tom Watson had a great chance to beat Stuart Sink and didn't get it done. But I'm not saying Padraig's going to win this week. I'm going to go cautious here, conservative with a top 30 play at plus 190. But look, I think he makes a lot of sense for DFS. I think he makes a lot of sense for essentially anywhere you want to play him because uh, this guy who's made the cut in seven straight events against the flat bellies. 
against the senior circuit. He's got a win, a couple of runner-up finishes, six top tens in eight starts. I, the guy still plays really good golf. Still, it's in a long way, too. I mean, I, I almost, with a, a guy who's 51 years old, I almost look at it and say, well, it's a Lynx golf course. You don't really have to bang it out there. So the length and power doesn't matter. You almost want length and power to matter. He's as long as most of the guys were playing out there this week. So I, I don't think that's going to prohibit him whatsoever, even if the course is playing uh, longer than usual with some wind this week. So uh, I think Patrick Harrington makes a tremendous amount of sense this week. There's usually sort of one sentimental type player on the leaderboard for a few days at least at an open championship. Tom Watson back in the day. Uh, we've seen some other uh, some other uh, big name older players over the years. I, Harrington's my guy this week, and I think it could be a really good week for him. Yeah, uh, I sort of intimated at it earlier, as added earlier, like you said. Um, he just came down in terms of I was looking at him as a long shot, and then he just came down too low. That's how that's how good his form is. So if you are looking in those top forty, top thirty, top twenty, even that is where the value for uh, Patty is. You're absolutely right. He could he could be that guy where we're talking about it. You're feeling getting that feel good narrative going ahead as you as you often do in opens and. If you said top 30, I'm going to go to the thir- uh, 13th hole for a top 40 plays. Um, I'm going to, again, I, I love to go to the plus numbers here. I'm going to give you two. One is uh, me being my bias self. I'm going to give you an Aussie at plus 150, and that's Lucas Herbert. Uh, look, he was T60th last week. He was T15th a year ago at the Open. He likes to prove himself in these big ones. Um, you know, so it's more of a just knowing the guy and knowing the chip on his shoulder play. I saw that he's a plus number for top 40. I think he's a good, uh, a good pickup there. Now at plus 230, um, a guy that many people may not know if they are PJ tour watches and not DP world tour watches is Yannick Paul plus 230. He's got five top tens on the DP world tour, two runner ups this season, T25 last week in Scotland. So he's coming in. He's a bolter for the Ryder cup. In fact, he was third on their, um, straight in Euro list until Robbie McIntyre took over with his finish at the Scottish Open. So now he's at fourth uh, with the top three getting picked up on that. So uh, plus 230 for a top 40. I love that number on Yannick Paul. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. All right, I'm going to stick with the DP World Tour regulars uh, with the 14th hole. Uh, I'm going with the sentimental play here uh, at the 14th. A guy who's been a Royal Liverpool member since he was seven years old. That was 20 years ago. Matthew Jordan, it was announced on Monday that he is going to hit the first tee shot. Not a ceremonial tee, first tee wow. shot. He will play the first tee shot of the Open Championship on Thursday morning. A uh, little advantage there in the tee time and the fact that he's yep. getting out there early. He should know every nook and cranny of this golf course. He's a pretty good player. He's had a nice little uh, trending uh, positively over the last handful of starts. I can get him at plus 180 for a top 40. I'm not going to go nuts, but... I think it's a nice little sentimental play, and I'm hoping that he doesn't suffer the same fate as, say, a Rory McIlroy playing a quote-unquote home game at Portrush four years ago, hitting his first tee shot OB and uh, taking himself out of the mix right away. Hopefully Matthew Jordan can at least keep it inbounds for a little bit. By the way, speaking of inbounds and out-of-bounds, have you seen this internal OB on the 18th hole at Hoylake this week, Benny? I did not. I need to get. I need to obviously get up to speed. I need to have a look at that. I can't believe I, that. That always bugs me when it's there. Always bugs me. Hate it. Hate it. I. I am a fan. I don't care if you have to climb a fence and get into your neighbor's backyard. If yeah. you can do it and you see your ball and you can get a swing on it, go for it. There should be no out of bounds anywhere. I don't care if you go uh, past the borders of your actual golf course. That said, this is internal out of bounds. You don't have to climb a fence. It's two yards off the right side of the fairway. And essentially what they're trying to do is keep players from just banging driver down that hole. It's a par five. I, I hate everything about it. It feels like they're just trying to manufacture something. At some Ugh. point, some player is going to lay one up down the right side. It's going to take a bad kick. It's going to go, quote, unquote, out of bounds, even though the ball's going to be sitting there in the rough. And, boy, it's going to be a controversy because I, I, I don't like anything about it. I, I feel like it just it, it takes away from the game. That that sucks, especially when you think of some of the great open moments over the years. Seve from the car park, you know, like literally like hitting it from near cars that were parked in the old days. And then, hey, if that was a, the case when Jordan Spieth last won, he wouldn't have won. 
he blasted that one into over the hills and took a drop out of the um the range basically you know like and then created that iconic moment there um oh manufactured internal ob what a bummer uh, I, I i to be honest i i should should have known about that but hadn't heard yet and now that i have i'm annoyed as much as you are yeah all right well get unannoyed and get your 15th hole all right where are we at the 15th hole yep 15th hole this is my long shot and as i said i looked at a guy at 50 to 1 as sort of the, the spot where i was going to go above for long shots um i tried to since I got a lot of Aussies and I did mention Adam Scotty, so I tried to stay away from him there and I tried to find someone else for you. And I got someone who has really been off the radar since winning this season and sits 11th in strokes gained total, fourth in strokes gained approach, fifth on tour in birdie average, and has played the open six times and never finished worse than, worse than T28. Completely off the radar for most people. Used to be a guy who I would never advocate in, in betting markets, didn't love him. But Tony Finau is 55 to 1. And as I said, could come out of nowhere. Look, he's not been playing great the last couple of months. But if you're looking for long shot, quote unquote, guys that actually have um, some gravitas to their game when they bring it, Tony, as I said, six times, T28 or better in opens, he could be that guy that everyone goes, oh, there he is. Where's he been? Uh, look, I, I would have thought Tony could win any of the other three major championships and still think he can win any of those. This is the one that I would say he'd probably have uh, a little bit of a tougher time winning. But uh, look, he's played well. He's a, He had a top five a few years ago at an open championship, finished in third place. So uh, it's certainly possible. No top 20s since winning the Mexico Open, uh, what, two, three months ago for Tony Finau. That said, uh, he is he is a very, very talented player. Um, at some point, that talent is going to manifest itself in a major championship victory. All right, 16th hole. I, I looked at the matchups at Bet365. Quite honestly, there weren't a ton that I loved. Justin Rose has a bunch of players around his number that I don't love. Right around that 50, 55, 60 to 1 outright number. And, and you kind of look around, you can find a Cameron Young not playing his best golf. Sam Burns, Wyndham Clark, I don't totally trust them on a Lynx course, even though they both played well last week. You, and, and I love both of their games otherwise. Uh, Justin Thomas, Bryson DeChambeau. I mean, uh, there are some issues around this number with some other players. So I like taking Rose over someone there. Now, the issue here is that Bet365 has only put Rose up against Tom Kim. I don't dislike Tom Kim as much as I dislike some others around that number, but just to show that I want to stick with Justin Rose – as a guy that I'm targeting for matchup plays, I'll take Rose at even money over Tom Kim in this matchup. I think it's going to be a nice week for Rose. Uh, you look at what he's done with his iron play. Positive strokes gained approach in 13 of his last 14 starts. Justin Rose is playing some very underrated, very solid golf over the last six months to, to a year. And uh, at some point, I uh, wouldn't be surprised if he challenges for another major championship could happen this week. Yeah, well, given the fact that that Tom Kim was part of one of the matchups that I had Adam Scott going over the top of, I have to go with you. Uh, and I think because Adam Scott and Justin Rose are very similar players, as we know too, and both have the game uh, for Lynx golf. Um, all right, are we ready, my big winner? Ready. All right, 17th hole. This will be a huge surprise to many people. Massive surprise. But, you know, I was going through my phone the other day. Well, actually, my phone just popped up. It gives you the memories and... Hmm. Just about a year ago, showed myself just having a little drink, a little sip out of the claret jug. And you know what? I'm going back to the well. I think Cameron Smith is decent odds, given what he's doing, uh, to win it again. He won't give it up easily. Absolutely won't. He won in London for the on the Live Tour recently, as we know. He loves the Open. Uh, T9 at the PGA, fourth at the US Open. Uh, and just the bulldog tenacity of this bloke and what's going on there, we'll see him not give this up with a fight. And I'll tell you what, this is this might sound weird to people, but you know what the kicker to get me over the line to put him in 17th hole this week was? What's Rory that? McElroy winning this week. Mm, he yeah. loves to beat someone more. That's I mean, literally the fact that he was four behind Rory starting last year and everyone was expecting Rory to win was what kicked him into gear to absolutely obliterate Rory and take over on at St. Andrews and win this thing. 
Yeah. I think that that actually feeds right into what Cam Smith needs. It'll have him right up from the get-go. Um, look, his, his Queensland Origin team are not playing this week like they were last year when they won. <laughs> They've already won the series. The series is done. The three games are done. Queensland won it. He's reveling in that. I'll tell you what else is going on. The other thing that, that um, Cameron Smith loves, and that's the Ashes cricket. Australia versus England in the cricket. We've had three matches. There's another one. The fourth match is coming up uh, during uh, the open order as it starts to finish. He will want to be taking, he wants to take the claret jug to the, the the locker room, if you will, of the Australian cricket team while they try to win the Ashes themselves. All these things are just very, uh, uh, well, the, the Aussie term is bogan, uh, that, uh, that what Cam Smith believes in. And I just uh, I just know he won't give it up without a fight. And when you're looking at the, the numbers, look, what I want him to be, what is he, about 16 to 1, 18 to 1? I'd love it if he was, you know, 30 to 1. Um, sure. But even 16, 18 is, like, he's not a, with Rory at seven, he's not that much, you know, he's, Rory's not double the better player than than Cam right, Smith is right. at Lynx Golf. That's where I saw the value. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you're going to hear this stat fairly often whenever they show Cameron Smith on TV this week, but since 1960, only, quote unquote, only Arnold Palmer, Lee Trevino, Tom Watson, Tiger Woods, and Padraig Harrington have gone back to back, winning the Open in, in two straight years. I say only because it feels like, oh, that's not that many. And then you go back and look at it, like, no, five players in the last, what, 73 years, last like three quarters of a century? Like, that's actually like a decent number. I mean, that's, uh, sorry, 40, 63 years, last six decades. Uh, come on, guys, it's math, it's tough. <laughs> you can add that up in my head. Uh, in any case, uh, for five different players to go back to back, that's not really a only modifier before that. That's actually like, that's it is more than any other major championship has had during that same time period so uh if someone's going to go back to back at, at a major you would think it would be the open just based on the history that we've seen all right 18th hole i've got my winner i, I have hinted at this on the podcast in previous weeks but victor hovland is my guy this week and i've had him circled for this one for a very long time in fact Going back to the PGA Championship and then what we saw in the aftermath two weeks later with him winning the Memorial Tournament. There's a little anecdote from the end of the PGA, and I've told this story uh, over the last handful of months, but uh, last two months. But uh, Victor Ovland, of course, made double bogey on the 16th hole while in contention, left a shot in the bunker, couldn't get it out. And then uh, afterwards, the, the happy-go-lucky Victor, the guy who's <laughs> always got a smile on his face, looked not necessarily like sad, not dejected. He looked mad. He looked like he wanted to go out back out there and uh, and play another four rounds and try to win another major championship that minute. I had never seen that fire, that intensity from Victor Hovland in the past. I thought to myself, in that moment, this is a guy who's going to do some really good things moving forward. Two weeks later, he won the Memorial Tournament. A lot of people picked him for the U.S. Open. I thought, I, I don't see him winning uh, too that quickly, but... I wanted to sit on him, wait for this week. Uh, this is a perfect week. He plays really well on Lynx Golf Course. As you mentioned it, Benny, right off the top, 12th place a couple of years ago, fourth place last year when he played in that final pairing alongside Rory McIlroy. Uh, last week did exactly what I wanted him to do, which was didn't play terrible and, and get me off the scent totally, but didn't contend. He wasn't in the mix the whole time. Finished in 25th place. It was just fine which is totally good by me. In fact, he's drifted a little bit in the marketplace from 18 to one to 20 to one. And I will gladly scoop up that number, scoop up some Hovland tickets. And I think that this could be the week. In fact, Benny, I, I started off by saying there's a big three in golf right now. It's Rory, it's Scotty, it's Rom. And we can ask the question, who's the best of the best? Maybe the better question to ask right now though, is who's going to be the fourth guy to join them and make it a big four. I don't know that Cantley and Shoffley can necessarily separate themselves from each other, let alone the rest of the pack. Uh, Jordan Spieth, Colin Morikawa, not necessarily. It could be a Kepka or a Cam Smith, but it's such a small sample size. We don't see them on a regular basis against the world's best. My vote and what I think will happen, if at some point it becomes a big four, the fourth player in that four is going to be Victor Hovland. And I think it starts this week. Yeah, look, I mentioned him earlier. This is my number three guy, if you will, in the top five place. So I can't argue with what you've got. 
Um, I think the other big thing we talked about um, off the back of your story there is that that was also the re- the last nail, if you will, in the coffin of Hovland playing too aggressive at the wrong times. Like that was the the moment where he'd been already working on via stats with uh, uh, Molinari, not, uh, what is it, Eduardo Molinari and his stats that had told him, you fire at too many. That doesn't mean you don't be aggressive because he still is, but you have to pick the right moments. And he, I think that was the final like, oh man, that going for that shot at the PGA from that bunker was not the right play. Um, because yeah, sure, it it it, it didn't give um it, it meant that he wasn't gonna probably probably wasn't gonna birdie that hole, right? But it also meant that he wasn't gonna give away the tournament if he had have played out, tried to wedge and make a putt and stayed one or there even two back with a couple to play would have given him a chance. Instead, he went for a hero shot. We'd seen Corey Connors make the same mistake in the same tournament and and essentially get himself out of contention. Um, it's those moments. And I think that's one of the reasons why his caddy, Shay, was also visibly upset and angered after the PGA. I can think, think he took it upon himself to be like, I wasn't forceful enough in that moment. I wasn't, I didn't convince him to go with his, his what he has been his new way of doing things. Um, they took that to heart, went and won the memorial. Um, as you said, it's hard to win straight after. I loved him for the US Open all year until he won the memorial. That made it harder. Right. Uh, right. So yeah, look, if he takes the right attitude in, keeps the smile when he gets it, everyone gets a bad break at the open at some point. If he smiles after it and can recover from it like he did at the Memorial, huge chance this week, huge chance. It's driver great. It's those long and mid irons great. I see a lot of those uh, working really well at Royal Liverpool. Uh, that's all we got, everybody. Appreciate you listening to this edition of the Links and Locks Best Bets podcast presented by Bet365. Remember, you can find our podcast anywhere you find your favorite podcast. Download, subscribe, rate, and listen every single week during the PGA Tour season. For Ben Everell, I'm Jason Sobel. Good luck with all your picks for this week's 151st Open Championship. Here's hoping you guys. The green. The green.